Uh, well, no, I well. I thought you had, had enough of me. Don't get old is the message. Uh, so, uh, just because Mike, Mike and Jude both have slides, so I'm going to put Jude's up first. Okay, come on. And then... Uh, uh, yeah, maybe just... Uh, no one else has got slides, have they, Sarah, or... I am, but you are. Yeah. You have a lot of slides. And before we start, Hannah, um, yes. Jude is our outgoing chairman of Rescue, who's got a lot of experience of working with metal detectorists and others in Norfolk, too. Suffolk. Suffolk, exactly. Great. Michael Lewis. Michael, you're from the British Museum. I am, yes. And you're to do with the implementation of the Treasure Act? Not really. No, I'm head of Portable Activities and Treasure at right. the British Museum, but we've obviously been helping the DCMS with the review of the Treasure Act. Right. So you're the central area of the Treasure? Well, the Finance Liaison Officers are coordinated through our project. Through your project, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, and Sarah, you. Historic England? I'm the Historic England, and I'm in the rural advice team, so we are sort of the government um, uh, agency, agency body. Yes, well, uh, giving arm, advice on policy regarding. Arm, arms length government yes, body. Arms length government body. <coughs> and just to show your enthusiasm, you've also been today <laughs> working with the. Yeah, the Archaeologist Club as well, so yes. Well, I better not get the county wrong, was mm -hmm. that? I didn't. Where was that, Donald? In Cambridge. Cambridge, yeah. Cambridge. And uh, Tim, you're from Norwich Museum? Norwich Castle Museum. Norwich Castle Museum. And I believe Jude tells me that one of your areas of expertise is Saxon. Anglers. Sorry. Sorry for me saying it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <in the middle. laughs> and do you yeah. also get involvement with metal detecting fines? Yeah, yeah, I just end up having to buy the stuff. So, so right, okay. I hope we can touch on that later as to how that comes about. Yes. That would be very interesting. Yeah. And the format will be that Jude's going to show us some slides, talk a little bit, and then you're, you're going to talk a little bit with yes. some slides, and then you're each going to talk a little bit, and then we're going to have a panel discussion. Yes. With everybody and else. you're going to guide us forward. Right, um, Hannah very sensibly, in being at a university, put up a few questions at the beginning. Um, that's the questions we were asked to consider. Mm -hmm. I'm actually going to start off by ignoring that completely. I'm going to be utterly self-indulgent because, after all, I just retired as chair of rescue and I've got lots of acts still on. Um, and just do a bit of a history of metal detecting in me because it actually goes back rather a long way. Um, this, I think is probably the earliest picture of somebody using a detector, in this case a mine detector, mm -hmm. to hunt for archaeological objects on a field that had of course already produced a massive haul of treasure and a treasure trove. Um, I mean that again is a story in itself in that it was found in 1942 and not reported till 1946 so there is nothing new about problems in the system um, and uh, the efforts of Tom Lethbridge who was a professional archaeologist of sort <coughs> intermittently um, the, the vision of him looking for more, he, he was convinced there was more stuff on the field, and then because he found some Georgian silver, he was convinced that actually it didn't come from that field at all. And we've had a lot of any complex problems with actually defining that particular set of treasure over the years. I will go no further with that, it's just a good piece of history. I then thought, well, I ought to be starting with my history, but I went back slightly before it. Didn't want to see Sorry, I'm just going to do this Sorry. So, if you want to come back to the slides, do. <laughs> in, in 1971, I think this was, must be one of the largest metal detector finds ever. It must have blown their bloody ears off. <laughs> It's one of those big lead tanks. 
but it was found using the metal detector. Um, I've no, no more information than that, because I wasn't working in Suffolk at the time. It was before my time. Well, before, well, a few years before my time. But um, so there is a long history in East Anglia of working with and alongside detectorists. Um, from 1974 onwards, as I say there, we took a cooperative approach. Firstly, certainly in Suffolk on excavations, the traditional thing we use a detector on the spoil heap was what happened on several quite major sites in the early mid 1970s. Um, from 1970, late 1970s onwards, we were detect we were going to the only club that existed and recording finds and encouraging individuals to bring stuff in. That was all fine, except that of course what happened and what, what has happened since is that the numbers are ever escalating in various ways. Um, the graph on the bottom left shows you the rise from 1987, by which time we were recording a reasonable amount a year, we were recording over a thousand finds a year, and it just went rocketing up through the 80s and sort of levelled out when the past started roughly at around about 4,000 objects a year. I have to say that if you're doing a full-time job being a, 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 a curatorial archaeologist and you're recording 4,000 objects, you're trying to do at least two jobs in one and it's bloody hard work and it winds people up because you can't give them their fines back quickly enough. It's an endless problem and it's still with us. Um, Suffolk doesn't claim that this means that everything was always fun and roses and we got on with everybody all the time. We had criminals just like everybody else. I highlight this because it involved rescue. Rescue got involved in the case of the Ecklingham Bronzes, which were removed illicitly in the 1980s. They reappeared in a New York gallery in the late 1980s. But by some miracle, one of the criminals had taken some photos of the objects before they left the country, which is what those things on the left are. Um, so the photos that existed, so we could actually match photos to heavily yeah. stored objects, mm. which by the time anybody realised what was going on properly, particularly the landowner realised what the hell was going on, had been sold to Leon Levy and Shelley. White, who are a terribly respectable American collecting couple. Well, he's dead now. I'm not sure how, how alive she is. Is she still alive? Anybody know? <laughs> no, but no. anyway, so Rescue supported the landowner in his efforts to try and get his property back. And alongside that, at the time, we called for the UK to ratify the UN 1970 Convention which did finally happen in 2002. And I said this morning that rescue tends to call for things a few years before they actually happen. We like to be <laughs> ahead of the game. <coughs> Another of those peculiar highlights in life was the Hoxham Horde. I put that up because it was a detector find that was excavated, most of it, at least 60% of it was excavated, and it's said that this stimulated work on the new Treasure Act in the 1990s that led to the Treasure Act in 1996, and also stimulated the creation of the Portable Antiquities Scheme. I think mainly because Roger Bland had to write up the, initially <laughs> write up the coins, and he was so gobsmacked by the whole thing that he realised that there was a need to actually do something about the treasure trove law as it then was, which was a complete shambles. I mean, we were not actually complying with the law, generally speaking. If somebody came in with a silver coin on its own, we said, that's very nice, you can take it away again, which was actually technically not legal, mm. because anything made of gold or silver, you were meant to do something, and we didn't. Um, and the final bit of my personal history in relation to detecting is that since late 2017, I have been working on this project based here about lordship and landscape in East Anglia between 400 and 800. 
And this is because over the previous 10, 10 years, 10 years, there has been this amazing metal detecting survey which started out from a very short funded archaeologically run project but moved into being the detectorist doing it by agreement with the landowner because of course none of us could have afforded to pay them for the many, many man days they have put into this project. And you can see how they do it. They cover the ground systematically, um, backwards and forwards. And they use GPS, which is one of those great modern godsends like the computer. It makes a big difference to recording where finds are coming from. It makes it much simpler than wandering around with little maps and putting crosses on maps, which is what we used to do. But the work I'm doing now is going back and looking at stuff that was recorded in the 1980s from similar sites to Rendlesham, looking at how it compares and how, how the sites compare and we actually have the data. Now, many other areas, the data is still building up, but it's a good example of what you can achieve. Okay, I'll come back to the point now, which is what we're meant to be discussing. <laughs> Those are the questions. Am I going to answer them? Well, probably not really. Um, what I am going to do is say, with my rescue hat on, this is our policy as we published it in 2017-18. And the key thing is that we split it into two bits. We said that we should look at non-professional activity, excavation and survey, separately from issues about antiquities, because the two get terribly confused, mm. and we all end up talking at cross purposes. So what we've said in our issue 10, which is about community amateur and community mm. survey and excavation is that there is a problem in this country that we do not have an archaeological work licensing system. All we have is monitoring, careful monitoring, specifying, etc. on the development led archaeology. But nothing else is covered by anything at all unless you want to go and dig up a scheduled monument, in which case Sarah writes your brief, or tells you to write her a brief, more likely. Um, so what we said in the policy, and this is over a year ago, was that we thought there should be a national investigation into the feasibility of a licensing system for all archaeological work, including metal detecting. And that meanwhile, we should advocate for a case-by-case -case approach like this. Um, and that we also would advocate for the introduction of legally enforceable compulsory reporting of all recovered archaeological material. Obviously that requires adequate resourcing for the procedures mm -hmm. to do it, which is again another issue, as I said, all these things lead to mountains mm -hmm. of fines coming in the door. On antiquities we're equally clear that there are enormous problems. Um, both coming into this country and the stuff that's found in this country. Um, and we think we should look at the Scottish system. I think there may be problems about trying to make England follow the Scottish system when it comes to property law. Mm -hmm. But it would be nice if we could. We should at least talk about it and find out what the pros and cons. And then I very quickly looked at... I circulated the rest of the panel so they know what rescue draft ideas on the treasure concentration are. Um, on the actual sort of physical proposed changes, they're talking about the process um, and our only caveat on in ways of improving the process is we must not put a greater load onto museums, because museums are desperately overstretched locally. Rescue has been endlessly campaigning about the fact that local museums are under-resourced, they're being pushed out into the private sector, they're getting ridiculous ways of staffing that don't involve specialists, etc., etc. So we have to be careful that we don't overload the local museums while looking at this process. 
Extending responsibility to buyers of potential treasure, that's a simple one, isn't it? <laughs> it fits with law anyway. It should never have been left out. Uh, we are very unhappy with attempts to define what an archaeologist is and what an archaeological investigation is, while absolutely agreeing that a professional archaeologist should never be profiting in any way from anything you know, from the physical value of mm. something they find. I think that seems clear. Mm. Um, we, we, we think actually the way it's been phrased is actually we're taking this a step back because <coughs> we read, some of us read the previous version of the code as saying that no archaeologist should get a reward. And this is saying nobody doing an archaeological investigation should get a reward, and that's rather different. If you've, got an in, if you've got a professional investigation, you have the paperwork that says nobody gets any reward for anything they find. It should be built into the paperwork every time you dig a hole or as a standard. Um, mm. Changes to the definition of treasure. We are unhappy about the fact that the suggested changes are about, they're, they're talking about employing financial value criteria rather than archaeological or historical value. Mm. So we're really not happy about adding objects that are greater than 10,000k value. And we're a bit unhappy with the definition of which silver, you know, selectively going for silver, single gold coins. Um, I'm personally fine with the inclusion of Roman artifact hoards because that seems utterly consistent with the rest of the Act. Well, the rest of the Act as it is so far. So that's the very specifics. And then, of course, there are the important questions at the end of this consultation, which are about the longer term. And essentially, we're very enthusiastic about extending the discussion to discussion of systems of licensing and licensing the use of detectors, and we really must look at bringing this into the line with the letter, the convention that we've been signed up for, to for bloody years, with not possibly reading the detail of what we've signed up to. We intended to accept, you know, the government has accepted his English Heritage Historic England's advice that we're signed up, fine, we're doing all the right things. It's a very moot point. <coughs> Certainly when it comes to detecting, it's an extremely moot point. Um, oh yes, I put Cadbury's in because it happened to be in the news at the time. But it is, it's a very good illustration of, you know, in this time yeah. that it wasn't called the Treasure Act. We did say this, Rescue said in 1996, the Treasure Act is the wrong name. It should be the Archaeological Objects Act or the yes. Court of Antiquities Act or anything other than Treasure. treasure. Um, we, yes, um, the Institute of Detectorists idea is great because it could tie in with some kind of very simple licensing system for the physical purchase of a metal detector in order to have a system whereby responsible use and reporting is encouraged from the moment you pick the machine up, rather than after you've found rather a lot of valuable bits and pieces. And we think that actually we need heritage law on a bigger scale. Sites and artifacts are not totally separate things. They're one continuum, and we badly need a new, we've been saying we need a new heritage act in this country for some considerable time. Um, and so that's my final point. Sorry to go on for so long. And can I come to you? Yeah, I'm so glad you want to come up next. Thank you, Jude, it's great. <laughs> If anybody wants to ask me questions about my silly pictures, you're very welcome. Mm. Well, Helen is struggling with me. Okay, I'm going slightly off this as well. Um, so I'm going to talk about something slightly different. But I'm hoping afterwards we're going to have a bit of time to talk about the, because obviously there's things that June talked about in relation to the, um, the Treasure Conservation also the um, Institute, or, or Proposed Institute of Detectors. 
Anyway, thanks for, for inviting me today and allowing me to be part of this um, panel discussion, because Rescue is exactly the right organisation for the debate that we're going to have, or we're having, in the context of Keith's presentation um, on the Institute of Detectives, and also the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport Review of the Treasure Act. Um, but for what I'm about to say, which is really about um, the infrastructure to support the recording of fines, including treasure. So Jude kind of very nicely kind of popped this up, so I'm, I'm going to take it a little, a little bit further, really. So as it's been said already, I head the British Museum's Portable Antiquity Scheme, which is a project, as you know, to record archaeological finds uh, made by the public. And with my colleagues at the British Museum and also the National Museum of Wales, we oversee the administration of the Treasure Act. Um, and as you all appreciate, the, the Act is designed, and sometimes this gets forgotten slightly, is designed to ensure that the most important archaeological finds in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland end up in public collections. Um, and that means going to local museums. All right, have a look at the slide. Is that good? Oh, yeah. So the Portsmouth Antiquity Scheme is obviously vital to the working of the Treasure Act, and without our network of 40 finds and liaison officers, locally based finds and liaison officers, um, across uh, England and Wales, it's difficult to see how the Act would function. It would otherwise probably fall on local museums to produce the reports on treasure finds, liaise with finders, landowners, coroners, etc. And as we know, most local museums, even if they have um, cur curators with archaeological expertise, so more uh, Norwich Castle Museum is very lucky in that respect, um, they're overstretched and underfunded. So even though Tim, for example, loves treasure, um, he can't <laughs> spend all the time <laughs> in his day uh, dealing with it. So just to put this into sort of context, um, last year there was uh, 1,160 treasure cases, um, which may be a single find or could be a group of finds, and a further 70 or so thousand others that were recorded on a voluntary basis uh, with the Portable Antiquity Scheme. Um, so even for archaeologists who are kind of sceptical about the benefits of liaising with the metal detecting community, most people uh, would agree that these finds should be recorded and this data made uh, public. And we know um, that the data is being used for archaeological research. Mm. Uh, at the last count, there's about 141 students studying course, um, PhDs that have used uh, Portable Antiquity Scheme data and probably 173 at master's levels. And these are people that are actually asking for the data to, to look at the fine spot position. There's probably lots of other people that are using the data in a more general um, way. And as we also know, the data's been used for development control purposes on a local level, and also various landscape studies as well. So at the heart of the Portable Antiquity Scheme, of course, is our database, um, www.finds.org.uk. And this was first developed by Oxford Art Digital as part of Heritage Lottery funding um, that expanded the Portable Antiquity Scheme to the whole of England and Wales in 2003. And then since then, thanks to the ingenuity of um, PS staff, notably our former ICT advisor Dan Pett, and also more recently colleagues at the British Museum, it has been redeveloped and enhanced. And most notably, it's, it's now held on new servers and has been somewhat refreshed. But as it stands, the PAS database, or the platform that it's, um, it kind of works on, um, is end of life. That's just what these, um, this is what <laughs> IT specialists tell me, and the kind of things that sounds good, doesn't it? And it basically needs rebuilding. So a specific problem that we've got is that the database has never really been properly rebuilt since 2003, essentially because of the resources needed to do this. And so it's, it's the way it's explained to me by people, that it's like an old car, it's got nice new wheels and probably a nice shiny Ferrari badge on the front and um, you know nice seats and stuff but essentially it's an old thing um, with lots of bolted on parts um, which still makes me feel great of course um, anyway as you'd expect um, with a database as bespoke as the Portable Antiquity Scheme one it's not simply the case that we can use an off-the-shelf model on the market even the much newer and more sophisticated European spines databases such as that of Pan in the Netherlands and Dime in Denmark, cannot easily uh, easily kind of used for the Portable Antiquity Scheme, though obviously we can learn from what they've done. Uh, one of the problems, of course, is that when you have a database and you collect uh, lots of material, um, is how you deal with the old stuff, not necessarily how you kind of input the new material. So that's the biggest problem, really. 
So over the past few years, the British Museum has been investigating what should be done, even employing a business analyst to understand the situation and recommending a way forward, which we've got, which is great. And as a result, it's estimated that about half a million pounds is needed uh, to do this work, uh, which is obviously a lot of money. Uh, the good news is that the British Museum has now agreed that the rebuild can happen, but the slightly unfortunate news is that I have to fundraise for this uh, externally. <laughs> Uh, so, we're at a kind of critical point, I feel. Um, we don't know when the current Portable Antiquity Scheme database will cease to function, but the British Museum is spending about 60 grand a year um, just to keep it going, fixing bugs and all that sort of stuff. That's staff time, not really any kind of infrastructure costs. Um, so, as you appreciate, without the Portable Antiquity Scheme database, the fines and officers won't be able to do their work, and there obviously won't be a mechanism to record detector fines and other um, fines. And if we, so I, and I do think it is a we problem, cannot find this money for a new database, then obviously I'll have to look to doing that within my core budget, which is basically the, the money we fund the staff with. So, I mean, obviously, if we did that, if we had to cut the scheme to fund the database, which obviously I'm hoping that I won't have to do, yeah. um, it's going to impact on the viability of the scheme as a national scheme. So the reason I kind of mention this today is, you know, whilst we talk about whether metal detecting should be restricted or licensed, what training might people like or should have, and what should the Treasure Act look like and the definition of treasure, etc., we've got to obviously consider that within the context of the realities of the world uh, around us. Um, so it's my view, and it's essential, that we have the ability to record these fines at the very least, but also that we have robust mechanisms to ensure that the most important of these add to museum collections. And without the Portable Antiquity Scheme um, and, the, uh, and our database, I just think we won't be able to do that. So it's supposed to, it's not, I don't think it's as bad as it sounds. I mean, I'm, I've got a lot of good people within the um, British Museum who are kind of thinking of all the different funding routes that we can um, use, and we've got development uh, department within the museum that are going to help with that. So, but it is obviously a lot of money um, to, to raise. Um, and, and just to put it in a kind of a financial context, um, the British Museum, the, the, the Portable Antiquity Scheme, we give about a million pounds from the British Museum funding to the local partners to employ the post. And as Jude will know, that is not the total fund needed. Um, most local organisations have to invest their own resources as well to, to make that happen. So the scheme probably costs about one and a half million, I reckon, a year, probably, um, in real cash. Um, so it's quite an expensive project to deal with uh, what we used to call the problem of the metal detector. Anyway, I'll end there because I think in the discussion other things will pop up. And I'm very keen to talk about the Treasure uh, Act itself anyway as well. Well, that's great. Thank you, Michael. Very good. Um, do the panellists want to come up? And then just since there's Jim, like, Jim's going to say a few words on you. Well, and uh, Sarah. Well, I'm nothing particular, but I can gladly say that you yeah, want to come up. No, no, okay. I'll come Useful just to uh, uh, give a sort of a, a brief uh, pen portrait as well of, of myself and maybe why I was asked to stand here. Uh, and obviously, I'm a curator at Norwich Castle Museum. As you've heard, Norfolk was in the van of starting to identify the finds that were coming up through metal detecting. And essentially, Norfolk is a real microcosm of the entire problem of metal detecting, but also the potential uh, and what it can do really for museums and for the public. And uh, the problem, if you like, of what we do, where we go with the database, is, is very interesting because in Norfolk we were one of the last people to start putting things onto the Portland Antiquity Scheme database because everything was recorded by the HER. And we were using the HER as our tool for recording all of the fines before the Portland Antiquity Scheme was set up. So it is, it's not impossible that we can continue to record things if the database suddenly crashes but it's certainly not going to give us that public output mm. because it means that you have to go to Gresson Hall and look through the actual records. That said, we used to record about 21,000 fines a year. We now record about 16,000 fines every year just from Norfolk. So clearly, if we had more members of staff, 
we could go out and chase more clients and go certainly out there, but we just don't have the, the, the person power to do that. And when I first came to the Castle Museum, I became very aware of the quantity of material that was coming through. And I, I always likened it to the generation game that, you know, here we see a lovely Rubik object passing through, a Roman statuette, another coin of Anglo Saxon uh, chatters, and, and so on. And, so, for instance, last year we had 10% of all English and Welsh treasure cases in Norfolk alone. And that, in turn, means that there's an enormous amount of pressure on me as the archaeological curator in Norfolk to be able to try and, if you like, rescue um, or certainly uh, acquire the best, and um, for my way of thinking, the most um, intellectually important pieces mm. for public ownership. And that's why we get absolutely sick of yet another gold medieval ring because <laughs> lovely we've got loads of them. We don't really need to think about that sort of thing anymore. Whereas the runic disc that Michael showed a minute ago, I was sort of slathering over because that these are just the really rare things that actually start to tell us something new about society and which we really should be saving and which under the revised terms of the Treasure Act, if we go for a value element, will almost certainly simply be ignored. And they're the sorts of things that we need to perhaps start thinking about. Um, now, because I've got this uh, big treasure hat that I wear um, in having to acquire stuff, I used to start contesting prices with the Treasure Valuation Committee, saying it was absolutely disgraceful, this uh, beautiful medieval ring, or not medieval ring in my case usually, but uh, an Anglo-Saxon brooch was valued at such and such a price, and it was disgraceful. And because of that, ultimately they said, well, if you think you know so much, why don't you join us? So I actually sat on the <laughs> Treasury Valuation Committee for 10 years. And so uh, as a result of that, I feel hopefully I might have something to add to some of the sort of situations that we can talk about, where, for instance, things like how do you identify an archaeologist um, as part of this? And I, I have um, a slightly different view to, to Jude because I think that we do have to be very careful about how we define things like treasure. There's one particular case where an amateur archaeological group was excavating a trial pit in Wales. And the next day, because it wasn't finished, someone came back from that group to finish off the excavation and found a gold ring. And they promptly charged, they, they promptly claimed the value of that ring through the Treasure Act. And I don't think that they should have been allowed to have done that, but because they said that the archaeological excavation had finished the day before, they came back, therefore they should be eligible to call that reward. Personally, that I think that hole was only opened as part of an archaeological project, mm -hmm. therefore they should not have benefited from it. At the same time, I know of a, a metal detectorist who is now a professional archaeologist working for one of the big units in the east of England, and he detects in his spare time on fields as, as, as an individual. Should he not be eligible for the rewards because he is a professional archaeologist? Well, bloody, I think he should be. So, we it cuts both ways. <laughs> <laughs> we do so not agree. Yeah, I, I, think, I, I think we've known the same individual as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there, there are various uh, nuances of this that I, I think are very difficult to tease out. Yeah. I will sit down, I think, at that point, and maybe we can talk to your own. <laughs> so my name is Sarah Poppy. I work for Historic England, and I kind of have a, you know, everyone's brought their own personal tone to their presentation, so I thought I'd do the same. I come from a, a farming background, and I'm a former colleague of Jude, so I've been very much brought up in a tradition where archaeologists, metal detectors have worked sort of collaboratively with, with, with archaeologists. And in my most recent role, I've been an assistant inspector of ancient monuments. So I've had to um, provide advice on proposals that affect, may, may include metal detecting to make sure that it's consistent with, with our policy. And I just wanted to alert people to the guidance that we have, our portable past, which was um, published or republished in, um, early in 2018, which we have to set out a sort of consistent approach of how we view metal detecting as part of the part of the sort of the archaeological process, and uh, to provide a benchmark against which we provide our advice. Um, so part of my role now in Historic England is to collate um, feedback from colleagues to input into the review of the Treasure Act, which, as you can imagine, is a particularly interesting <laughs> interesting job. So um, 
I don't want us to say any more. I think it's more important that we, we talk about the, the questions that, that have been raised. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, not sure how to proceed now, Jude or Hannah. Um, so I would say, is there, uh, Jude, you mentioned that you completely disagree with Tim. <laughs> <laughs> um, so perhaps start with uh, the, the, the issues. There's obviously with the Treasure Act, you have, um, the, one of the main things is the defining of treasure and also the defining of what an archaeologist is. And it's closing on the 30th, so how do we, how do we unpick those sort of nuances and situations like that? Do you want me to say something on the definition of treasure? Well, well, before that, I would say that one of the things that really does concern me is that we should be licensing all archaeological work, and that that one metre test bit should have had the documentation around it to prevent what happened. Does that seem fair on that one? So, well, I was voted down on the Treasure Valuation Committee. Yeah, yeah well, I, I expect um, to, perhaps the Treasure Valuation so, Committee needed a bit of a big thing. But, <laughs> but, I mean, I don't think it's a good idea to define, uh, to define what is an excavation without saying, and that excavation must be properly documented and the legal situation made clear. I think, uh, I think equally important is actually that waivers are regularly signed by um, excavation units who get detectorists in, and that does not happen at the moment. There have been numerous cases that I know of where a detectorist has worked on <coughs> an excavation, or, or even come to, excava uh, to detect on a spoil heap that's been left by an excavation, and they can claim the reward for it. Well, that's There's, disgraceful, Jim. Yeah, it, it is, no, but it happens. I mean, it's, it, this is, I'm afraid this is part of the legacy of archaeologists saying that yes. detecting is nothing to do with us. So and sort of keeping I it, yes, yes, it is yes. a fault of the archaeologists, not of the detectives, that this has been happening. It needs sorting. And Algeo are clearly making very positive remarks to Keith, and they have to get, you know, they have to get the curatorial hands in all the time. I think that the flip side to this is that you end up with a system uh, like in Ireland, where I remember hearing uh, an Irish curator talking about how there is not a lot of illegal metal detecting in Ireland. Yes. yes. I don't believe it. I think that there will always be illegal metal detecting, and, whatever you do. And this is why the but things the like Keith's Institute, I think, are important, because yeah. this is where there is a shift in the metal detector. Just when I go to the clubs, which, again, I do in my own time, it's not part of my job description, but I know that if I don't go, they see the whites of my eyes, then I don't have such a good relationship with them. But if you do have detectorists, they, they crave one thing, and that's more land. I think that our detectorist friend at the back would probably agree that however much land you've got, there's never enough. The grass is sometimes always greener, but certainly, this is the, the one thing people want. And if you have detectorists coming up to you saying, could you just give me a reference so that I can get onto this land or so that I can show a farmer, I have to say no, because it shows me in a bad light as favouring one particular person over another. Mm. If you have something like um, an organisation of people that are validated as using metal detectors in the most positive way, then that gives you an incentive to go through that. It means that you can say to a landowner, well, you know, archaeologists will support me. And that's the way, a bit like the missive detecting, that you're going to get people on your side and wanting to do it legally. There has to be something in it for them. And I think that that is probably the biggest advert for the sort of thing that Keith is advocating. Yes, I think actually the landowner is the key here because um, you know, at the end of the day, they're the sort of gateway to this. Mm. It is that, that if the landowners can be convinced that, that, that people on their... Um, or knocking on their doors, uh, have gone through um, some form of process and, uh, and can be relied on uh, as best they can. I, mean, I, I think a detector's passport is a, is a really good sort of idea for this, where you've got a photograph, you know who the person is, the, there's the ID there, um, possibly who the um, FLO is as well, and proper insurance through, uh, through Towergate. 
Um, but but, but it, it's the actual landowner who's the one who can actually try and say, uh, you know, we would much prefer you to be part of the institute um, and uh, we know that you are going to comply with not just code of practices, but, but I think we should be going one stage further to a code of conduct, which is uh, you know, a slightly more detailed um, document form. But all, I think also to actually be buying into it. Yeah. You know, yeah. So it's yeah. not just a bit of, of, of paper, but actually really getting what we're doing and why we're doing it and, and wanting to fulfil that. Yes. Yeah. Um, one, one thing that Keith has said, and just was slightly reiterating your comments there, um, if you have a, an established institute, um, I was sort of picturing something a bit like the North of Archaeology Society, where you sort of have a training um, regime, you have code of conduct about operating on diet sites, and in fact the NAS um, has exclusive rights on some historic dive sites, or any diving has to be done through a license holder on that site, um, if it's a protected record. Um, but it's a, it gives an imprimatur to the practitioner. If, um, you know, in this case, we're talking about the tectoris. Um, and it's not just Joe Soap turning up with his detectorist, detector kit and sort of asking if he can do that thing. Um, you know, he can sort of give substance to his own integrity by having his membership. And if you go to, say, people like the Country Landowners Association and the National Farmers Union, and they're aware of it, then that's something that they can rely on as well, particularly if there's a requirement to be um, insured. Um, because then the farmer or landowner can say, well, are you a member of? Because, you know, that's what we all think is the minimum requirements that you should have. So there will be um, external forces pushing in favour of the legitimate like there's, there's an awful lot of, of education, if you like, to be done with landowners. We perhaps, uh, as archaeologists, we perhaps um, focused on metal detector users. And I'm speaking as someone who owns a metal detector. I've worked on metal detecting projects, particularly um, at one on a Shedden Monument site, where we've had Shedden Monument consent for. And I, I think that, sorry? Not for Cadbury's, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not this time, oh, not this time, this is like, this is me. <laughs> but you know, working with metal detectors, they, they are fantastic people. And you know, we, we know from the, the comment about being used uh, in excavations or not used, if they do often stay in the van, or if they are used, they're used incorrectly, because the metal detecting is a real skill. and you. You have to know how to use the machine effectively to get, get fines. And this is why we have to try and work better as, as archaeologists with, if you like, semi-professional uh, metal detectorists. At the same time, we've had a number of metal detectorists who are trusted people working on scheduled location monuments. For instance, there's one, a Roman temple site in West Norfolk, where a detectorist has been working on the basis that everything is going to be recorded, the site had been night hawked, and so he was allowed on. That's fine, it's brilliant, we've got a really good record of that. The problem comes that he then sold, with the landowner, all of that material, and I was the mug that had to raise the money to buy it. <laughs> so, you know, it's one thing to have detecting regulated or however, but this still doesn't get away from the fact that we have this stuff that has a commercial value in the present world that we have to try and resolve. This, this, is one of, yeah. this is an aspect of metal detecting that very little is made of. That landowners actually are very unaware that they actually have a legal right to the ownership of, of the material that's, that's extracted Don't believe from, it. from their land. Don't believe it. Is that not correct? Some landowners are more than aware. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that doesn't mean they're any more use to us. <laughs> or him. I mean, sometimes with landowners, we kind of, I mean, we've done a lot of work actually with the CLA and the NFU in terms of kind of working with them on, on guidance for landowners, and they've produced some articles in magazines to highlight the kind of issue, if you like, of metal detecting and, and that. And, and, and like you say, um, Tim, I mean, there is obviously a lot of landowners are quite very aware of them. The commercial value of these objects. 
indeed, you know, rallies happen because landowners know they can make a lot of money very easily from allowing a lot of detectorists onto their, onto their land. I mean, sometimes as archaeologists, I think we fall in the danger of actually thinking that landowners are somehow, I don't want to say this in a rude way, but kind of more saintly than sometimes they, they are. And indeed, you know, it kind of reassures us weirdly somehow, um, sometimes, that um, the landowners have this better right to the archaeology than us, because in some ways as archaeologists, most of us probably would say, well, actually, it shouldn't be anyone that owns it. It should belong to mm. the kind of state. Mm -hmm. But we kind of use landowners in a way because mm. it kind of reassures us in terms of the detecting community to some extent. So, I mean, I, personally, I kind of think we, we do need to think about who actually owns the past because it is, as, as, you, as you say, Tim, kind of fundamental to the, the issue, really, that these objects mm -hmm. have a commercial um, value. And, and who then controls that and at the moment we have in this country a very, very wishy-washy approach to archaeology, method detecting, full stop. I mean, like, although the focus of our discussions has been on licensing and method detecting, what the government's talking about is licensing archaeological works, as is the case in Northern Ireland. That's where they've looked to as an example. And in some ways, only with a kind of a, a, kind of a, a more holistic approach to archaeology, I think you can deal with some of these sorts of issues. Because it, then it makes it very clear then, if you do have a project brief, if it is for method detecting, you know, is a license to go on land, or if it is to do, um, you know, schedule, you know, works on a scheduled monument or whatever, then it's kind of clear about what should happen to the stuff that's found as well. You can control that a little bit more. Sarah? I just have a quick question, um, comment on the licensing situation. I actually haven't been on there a couple of weeks ago, and very, it was very timely because I was able to sort of inquire about the, the system. And I, you know, I think we would have concerns about the, the scale of the issue in England and so in the resources needed to support it as opposed to the system that's working in Northern yeah. Ireland. And I, I asked them about 250 licenses issued per year. Compared to in England, we're having 5,000, 8,000 archaeological investigations that go through the planning system, goodness knows how many above and beyond, including potential detecting activities. So I think there would be a, a it's very challenging in terms of the, the resources and the capacity yeah. of the English system. And also there's a sort of loophole in the Northern Ireland legislation regarding metal detecting. Yes, I so, heard that. So you, you can, obviously you need a licence to do archaeological works, which is what the licence is required for, but you don't need a licence for to use a detector in Northern yes. Ireland to look for other stuff. Mm. And of course that's where most archaeological findings, that our detector findings come up from, is where Northern Ireland detectors are looking for other material yeah. and just happen to come across yes. archaeological so stuff. Though, no, but no, how no. do you know what the motivation mm. is to go back to mm. this? But, but, but it is operated as a bit of fun, isn't it? Yeah, I mean they accept, I mean obviously I think the people who deal with it, um, in this the Northern Ireland Environment Service and then also the Ulster Museum, they accept that mm. mostly these people are probably looking for archaeological material and they will just say, I was looking on my, my piece or whatever, and I just happened to find this, I don't know, it wouldn't be relevant, but anyway, something else. <laughs> <laughs> something else. Uh, that's one advantage, of course. They didn't have the Roman search. That kind of scales things down straight away. Yes, it does. Yes, quantities suddenly blow up. Now, I when a metal, I've got a friend who has been a metal detectorist. A friend. A friend. Yeah. A friend. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do have regular arguments about it. But, um, as I understand it, very often a metal detectorist would enter into an agreement with a landowner that whatever is found, the financial value will be split 50-50. That, I think, is what happens. Yeah. And obviously, if it gets to be treasure, then it goes to the valuation committee. Yeah. And, valued and then if a museum doesn't wish to buy it then it's doesn't if a, if a museum wants it they buy it off the owners the detectors no no, no. The, the system is that you are asked as a museum if yes. you want to express an interest in acquiring right. an object mm -hmm. if you are that object will go to the coroner who will declare a treasure and it will then have a preliminary valuation at the treasure valuation committee right the committee will sit and decide if that is the value, and then the museum will try to raise to the equivalent. It. But you buy it from the state because when it's the oh, treasure, it belongs to the crown. And, and does the state reimburse? It's a legal nicety no, that treasure belongs to the crown. So yes, you buy it, you send the money yes. off to the British Museum, and then the British Museum administer it and send the money out to the finder and to the landowner. Okay. Do the metal detectors? Do the metal detectors generally tell the landowner what they found? I imagine yeah. they do. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a fairly honest if, relationship. If you have to fill in the forms for the yes. 
treasure process. You have to fill in yeah. the letter. It might, be, it might be different with non-treasure finders, though. Mm -hmm. that's what I'm I'm saying. Saying. I mean, I think that's where the landowner is maybe how you possibly mm -hmm. can be ignorant or... Or can be um, trusting the metal detectors. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. 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 Or, I mean, obviously, I would say that most detectors would probably tell them if they find something quite significant, but there's probably, yes. I mean, people can tell me if I'm wrong here who do metal detecting, <laughs> but I, mean, yeah. I, I would say the mentality is that you kind of make an idea about whether this is really something the landowner should be bothered with or not. Yes, and if it's low value, you might not really bother to tell them much about it. Or some yes. people religiously show them. It all depends on the relationship with the landowner. Individual. Yeah. And, and, and the interest of the landowner. And the interest of the landowner. And, I mean, many landowners are happy to sign agreements that say, I want to know and share if the value is greater yeah. than so it's presumably a standard, choose a standard pro forma. Oh, standard similar. forms around, yeah. Yeah, there's both the CLA, I think it's the CLA and the NFU both have a, 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 pro, forma. a pro forma for their members. Yeah, gotcha. The NCMD also issues one mm. um, for its members, which obviously, you know, they'll have slightly different priorities, I guess, mm. to the NFU and the CLA. But um, nevertheless, there are these kind of set performers that people can use. And obviously we recommend, and it is a recommended practice, that, mm -hmm. that people do have those agreements about what's going to happen to the objects. Mm -hmm. But I think most people will probably say, it's the same on London in the, in, in the, in the foreshore as yeah. well, actually. Port of London Authority, in theory, well, in theory, in practice, owns rights to these objects. But most people will take a pragmatic view, they would say, about what they would bother them with and what they don't, in a way. So, you know, if they find lots of bits of pottery, in theory, that belongs to the landowner, but the landowner is not really going to be bothered with it, so they probably just might not bother to show yeah. you. Or tell I was them. very struck by a speaker at the conference, Hannah organised, Lord Renfrew. He, I've taken a quote from some words he said. He says something like, it's ines it, it is inescapable the circumstance that the finds have a financial value. Yeah. He talks a bit about mm -hmm. them, you know, the sale and the problems that causes. I cut off someone who was going to yeah. talk something else, um, that you, Hannah? I have a couple of questions. Uh, one of them is, uh, with the Treasure Act as its um, the consultation, if I'm right, they're trying to, um, it's trying to make the process of um, museums being able to purchase a treasure a lot more, uh, maybe tighter by giving a deadline of a month, I think it is. Shall I? I, I, I'll, I'll talk because uh, Tim's probably best to kind of come on the back of this, but I mean, in terms of what they're trying to do is that, obviously when the, the Treasure Act um, came into force, um, the, the Force of Antiquity Scheme didn't exist as it is now, and there are things that kind of happen in practice, which the Code of Practice kind of says are slightly different. Now it's always been the kind of idea, in terms of the speed with which a case goes through the process, that um, it should be done within a year, and that's a sort of aspirational idea. And what they've tried to do this, this time is, is outline exactly what time is allocated for what, the, what parts of the process. Now we all recognise that it's a sort of ideal time. So, the, so for example, the coroner will have three months in order to determine, you know, to hold an inquest, and the, the, the curator will have, or the planning officer will have about the same amount of time to write a report for the coroner, which obviously goes before that. Um, and then a museum will have, a, 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 I think it's about three, about three months to decide whether they want to acquire the object, and then if they do raise the money for that as well. So it's sort of break, broken down, but saying that, I think the government, and I can't speak for them, but they, they recognise that it isn't always quite as straightforward as that. So for example, it may be that a find of a, you know, a kind of a hoard of Roman coins, you know, several thousand of them, is not going to be dealt with by a curator within a certain amount of time, especially the conservation scheme and all that sort of stuff. Likewise, it may be that a museum is wanting to raise a, an object and the trustees need it another time, or it takes longer, and all of this sort of stuff. And I think, at the end of the day, if people were, I think the idea is that people are then up front with where they are in the process. So what they don't want is a museum to not bothering to reply to a, an email or something for months and months, which does happen, and then, you know, and then kind of follow up, oh, we don't, we're not really interested, you know, they don't want that. Or either museums to say that they're interested in a find, and then there, there has been, in the past, a kind of idea where you kind of just say, well, we might, we might as well say we're interested, um, and, then, um, and then at the end of the day we make a decision. So there's been cases where museums have kind of said that they're interested in an object, it's gone through the process, from our perspective at the British Museum, we've commissioned someone to do evaluation on it, which costs us money, um, and then they just turn around and say, oh, we're not really interested anyway. Now, there might be good reasons for a museum not to be interested, which is fine, but if they're just kind of going through the process and, you know, 
uh, kind of thinking, oh, we may as well see what it kind of comes out as. But then that's just a bit of a waste of everyone's time, really. So that's why they've introduced some of these timelines, just to try and make it a bit more clearer where, what the expectations are. But expect, we're recognizing that it might not always kind of turn out like that for lots of reasons. Yeah. yeah. It is tricky because um, I've had obviously an awful lot of cases to have to deal with, but I've really uh, been stymied recently because a lot of back cases that just never progress all came through in, in one big rush, and I've just had the biggest glut of treasure going through that I've, I've ever had to face. And it's, you know, £10,000 here, £8,000 there. These are big sums of money for us to try and raise. Mm -hmm. And I was... These are, sorry, these are things you'd like to buy? These are yeah. things that we've all expressed an interest in yes. acquiring. Yes. And one of those cases was from 2010, and it was a hoard of shatters. You know, the, these early proto-pennies that you get in the uh, 8th century Anglo-Saxon world, very, very rare as hoards. Yes. And we had two of them coming along like buses. Of yeah. ours. <laughs> one, one of them for um, nine, nine and a half thousand pounds in three different yeah. lots. So, you know, that's run back. And then last, this last week, I had eight treasure valuations all coming through one afternoon. Well, it might make sense for them all to be bunched up by the coroner to deal with it. Yeah. But it means that all of those things are going through at the same time. And from what Michael was just saying about, you know, you have to think very carefully about what you're claiming. In this particular instance, I know that one of those things that I asked to claim, and it, it's a board of Roman coins from Snettisham, really important site, I'm going to have to disclaim. Because I know that I simply cannot afford to pay or raise the money to pay for all of those things at one go. Because it's all going to come in a big blob. Whereas, you know, I, I've got a number of Roman denarii or denarius hoards yeah. in the museum. I don't have a 7th century Anglo-Saxon figure in yeah. which is one of the other things that's coming through. Yeah. You know, it, there is incredible stuff coming mm. through. And I mentioned about 16,000 odd finds. I wouldn't want those 16,000 finds that are found every year in the museum. Oh. But bluntly, we take in about a quarter of 1% yeah. of all the finds. And that is a really, really important series of objects, but we could probably take in quite happily about 1%. And then we're probably just doing our minimum duty really by, the, by the public. But because of the financial aspect of this, I'm really yeah. stuck. And I've been told by the funding bodies that, you know, you're going to have to make a decision. Which, which do you want? You've had quite a lot of money this year already, Tim. They, they, they know me when I'm on the phone. <laughs> um, and, and, and it is really difficult. And like I say to them, you know, I get 10% of all English treasure cases. I don't get 10% of the money. Wow. But they have to be seen to be fair and, and go wow. out. So I think one of the fundamental issues that we've got is while we're continuing to attach a financial value to these things, we need to, A, raise more money, centrally maybe, and there needs to be a better central idea of where the really rare stuff mm. is coming up and what nationally we should be trying to preserve, yeah. rather than mm. individual regional museums. Mm. But secondly, we need to maybe think about the way that we control antiquities as sale items. And this is, this is one of the reasons that I'm really, really glad that we're seeing as part of the consultation document the idea that anyone in receipt of treasure find to sell should be able to prove that it has been declared legally. Yeah. And I think that the same thing should, should be mm. going with something that isn't mentioned in the Treasure Act, and there's a separate consultation document on export licences, which was very, very poorly framed, because it didn't take into account a number of the issues that we really need. So that would cut, out. sorry to cut in, that would cut down on the knife hawk activity. Would, it would, would cut down, prove. It, exactly. Exactly, and there's a lot of material that we know is simply being flogged on eBay, and eBay are not the best. I have, haven't got there. an eBay account, but I have looked on eBay. It's absolutely astounding what's for sale there. Uh, but not just then. There are a number of auction houses that oh, yes. sell things <laughs> with uh, property of a gentleman from an old collection. Yes. And you know damn well it's been found <laughs> down the road about three weeks ago, and yeah. it's a really unfortunate thing. Should, should we be actually rethinking how? Finders are rewarded for um, for, for the, these things when they are declared treasure. Obviously, there has to be some kind of reward, or there'd be a disincentive to hoarding them, apart from it being criminal, criminal not to. 
Um, but I mean, if these things have a public val heritage value, surely that should actually trump the financial value and should be factored in. I mean, they, they have to get some reward, but should they really get the full market value? Yes. And should should they actually be 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 some kind of consideration of the co the cost of acquisition and conservation, mm. and and, mm. and the fact that it is a public service by actually. I yeah. think I think they have to be really careful here. And as a museum curator, I would love everything to be really nice and cheap so I could I could get it. I think we have to recognise the fact that this is under law private property, mm. and that these finders and the landowners do need to be properly rewarded for the material because it's no different to a landowner finding that he's got a tintoretto in the attic. There's no reason why he shouldn't get the full value for that. And we have to think mm. about the way that we distinguish. One of the things that one of our a sort of anti-detectorist bloggers, Paul Barford, goes on and on about is that everything pulled from the soil somehow is uh, to be put on a pedestal. But where do we draw the line between something like a bodkin that has gone into the ground and a bodkin that's never been into the ground? Or a 17th or 16th century piece of furniture that's never been in the ground with an 18th century piece of jewellery. You know, we have to treat all of these things as objects from the past, material culture, equally. That's very good. Yeah. Uh, Evelyn, sorry. Um, um, yeah, the distinction is between art and archaeology. That's the distinction. So but where does it end? Archaeology where, comes we, up we, What's art and what's archaeology? Mm -hmm. Well, precisely. Ar archaeology <laughs> comes up. No, there is a distinction. Archaeology comes out of the ground. That's, that's the distinction. So but it, isn't it a false has, distinction if it's the no, same no, sort of stuff that sometimes <coughs> comes from the ground? No, no, no. Also. The distinction is that it comes from the ground or not. But why, it, why is it any more valuable? It's, I, well, why should we put it on a pedestal just because it comes it's from It's not any more valuable. It's, it's got a different type of value. And that's, that's what I would put. It's, it's the point I'm trying to... It's the heritage Because value. it's got the story about where it comes from. It's the context. Archaeology is all about context. But you can have so, a, prov a clear provenance to something that hasn't been in the ground. And that's just as valuable. But anyway, the point I was going to... <laughs> the, the points I, I was going to make is... So first of all, it's not inevitable that all, um, all archaeology and all, all heritage has a, a, a commercial value, has a market value. That's, you can make the decision that you are going to make a distinction as in the, in the rescue um, policy between um, market value of, for example, art, and that's fine, there is an, an art market, and the um, archaeological heritage value of the artifacts that come out of the ground. And the way you make that distinction is, for example, to review your, your um, laws, and this, this has got to do with reviewing laws, Laws can be changed, and it's great that we are reviewing the Treasure Act now. I think it's, it's a timely thing. You do have to review laws every once in a while. And what this is an opportunity to do is to review the law on ownership. And you don't, it isn't unavoidable um, to, um, to, and inevitable to say that um, a landowner owns everything under, that's buried under the land, that owns all the archaeology. Britain is one of the few countries in, in, or England is one of the few countries in the world that actually does say that. And of course, a lot of American um, uh, heritage law came from um, the British uh, tradition. But um, Britain's one of the few countries in, in, in Europe that does actually say that. The other European countries, of course, um, uh, say that it's the cultural We're patrimony. We're not getting and, past and, all those Tory ministers. And, and it's, yeah, that's right. And this is, and, and, and look, Britain, of course, there, there, is a political, there, there is a political element to this. And, and, it's, and, and there, there, there is no um, uh, uh, you know, question that um, the Valletta Convention and the European Landscape Convention and, um, and uh, so on, the Illicit Antiquities um, Convention, were all finally ratified under a Labour government. Yes, of course, it's, uh, they're, they're, good luck getting it past a Tory government. It wasn't possible until there was a Tory government, but uh, until there was a Labour government. But um, what I was going to say about the Valletta Convention is that it's not just, we haven't just signed up to it. The Parliament ratified it. So it, it has been ratified by the UK Parliament. And so we do have an outstanding obligation um, to implement it. The complication in Britain has been that um, heritage is a devolved responsibility. So then it comes to, down to the individual uh, nations to, to actually implement it. So Scotland has to have a heritage um, act, uh, England has to have an heritage act, and Northern Ireland has to have uh, a heritage act, and so on. And that's been the stumbling point 
to um, actually implementing the Bilateral Convention. But when you look at this, what we have already agreed to and what Parliament has already ratified is this, is this licensing system for everybody. It's not just metal detectors, although it specifically mentions um, metal detecting. But the fundamental principle that we signed up to in the letter and when Parliament ratified it is the principle of preservation in situ. It's a conservation principle. And that is what we really need to be thinking about um, implementing in our new heritage um, law. And of course, we do need a heritage law, and England does need a heritage law. And that, that preservation in situ principle is what would help you with your problem of volume. Once you're not thinking in terms of people taking out of the ground um, uh, constantly thousands of, of objects, but rather pres preserving things in situ, then you actually get rid of your, your high volume. So you um, advocating principle. final metal detecting? No, I'm, I'm, I'm saying we should implement the Valletta Convention, which is the rescue policy as well, which is just to have a, a licensing. Licensing for all archaeological um, But the logical conclusion, sorry, I mean, I'm just thinking on my feet. The logical yeah. conclusion of that is that you're basically stopping people by licensing from removing stuff from the ground, isn't no, it? No, the principle of the Valletta Convention is preservation in situ. It's got to do with conservation. Which means, as yeah. a consequence, that you're going to be, by licensing, stopping people from detecting because they're going to be removing it from the soil. Otherwise. Well, no, you only remove things from, from the ground when necessary. That's the in situ conservation principle. You could finesse it. I'm again thinking on my feet here. Yeah. Uh, uh, when you always argue that cloud soil, although it is a context, is a mixed and rather destructive context for artifacts. And well. therefore, if it was properly done, you would not be breaking the rule, the Valletta rule, if you had a systematic removal of objects from plant soil where they were being constantly damaged. Where they, where they, so there's a, there's a necessity to remove it from it the ground. Be a, it, would, it would be a rescue. It's time. a rescue. That's most, I mean, to be honest, that's most metal detected finds. I mean, we reckon about 90% are found in the plough zone. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, so but, but that's, that means you still have to, but, but, but the letter still says you have to control yeah. that. But you still have to license. It has to be done under yeah, license. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, and, and I, I think we all, well, most of us probably think that a licensing system is, 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 a, a, is, a, is a good idea. I mean, it depends on how you sort of do it, doesn't it, really? Mm -hmm. um, but can I go back to, because I, I mean, I, I've got a big problem with preservation in situ in terms of metal detecting funds, because I don't think it really exists in most of the, most instances. I mean, I think they are, Predominantly finding stuff in the plough soil, so we'd still have a massive resource problem, even unless we said, unless we did say that licensing was very very strict in a particular way. As we know, there's lots of different ways. So, for example, in the Netherlands, they have licensing. It's basically a tick box exercise. It just says that you are required by law to report your finds. Who knows whether you do or not? I, I was in and lied on Monday, and they basically say to me that um, they estimate there's about 2,000 metal detectorists. There's about 600 that have got licenses. Yes. So it, it happened, but they're not necessarily saying them as illegal because it's, there's no law enforcement in terms of metal detecting in the Netherlands, and that was the problem for many, many years. So it's only since 2016 metal detecting has been banned, but PAN is recording historic collections of finds that were found before metal detecting yes. was illegal. You know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of finds. So, I mean, there is a sort of practical issue to that. But in terms of um, this kind of question of, um, of owning the past, I mean, I think it's a really interesting one. And I, I'm, with Tim in many ways, because I, like him, I would love the idea that these objects didn't have a financial value and the museums could just mop them all up or decide mm. what they want. I mean, I'd love, I'd love that idea. Um, but, I mean, then sometimes I kind of think, well, is it, you know, trying to think of it from a personal perspective, I mean, I like the idea that all of these archaeological finds that are found do end up in museum collections as well. You know, that's sort of um, a sort of utopian idea that everything that's found kind of ends up there because Tim can deal with it all. That's not my problem. Because it, I mean, he can recession all of this sort of stuff, so that's his problem. But, but, then, but if I kind of think of it myself, you know, the ownership of the past, I mean, the, the kind of logical root of this is, and I'm not saying this is right or wrong, but should we own anything of the past? When I walk through my 1900s house, terrace house, should that be owned by me because it's in the past, mm. or should it be owned by the state? Yeah. Um, or Georgian furniture? Are you allowed to collect Georgian furniture? 
Oh, it's okay, yeah. I'm sure he's probably all right. Yeah, well, no, 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 no,
Yeah, there's just a couple of points I'd like to make. Um, first of all, about um, the dis distinction between flower soil and non flower soil. Is that my experience as a detectorist is that, uh, yes, I agree that most of the um, recordable objects are found, on, as Mike Muir says, on flower soil. But they tend to be casual drops. I mean, the really big haunts, like the one I found, have been clearly, deliberately hidden in the wood. Nobody in their right mind is going to hide a big hoard in the middle of a flower field back in 1300. So detecting on pasture land, generally speaking, you will um, find mainly Victorian and um, 20th century finds, but there is a good chance that you might find the, the big hoard. Um, Second point, I agree with the lady in front of me, um, we are taking stuff out of the ground, and to be honest with you, um, we're all putting them in display cases, and I think, well, when we all pass on, what the hell are we going to have? Sorry, sir, do you mean in a private display case? Well, yes, I mean, my, yeah. I've got a huge okay. number of my own, and I think, well, if only I could say, mark them with some form of ultraviolet something, we could just chuck them all back on the field, so nothing gets double the quality. <laughs> 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 it's exactly the same place you found it, my God. That's right, okay. Yeah. 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 Can I just add yeah. to that? Um, that, that uh, I think a lot of detectives do uh, understand that, that, that they can't even give away their binds if they want to. I mean, <laughs> I can't. Mine was a big deal, like a yo-yo backwards and forwards to the museum. And uh, they bring me back, oh, Keith, do you want the, these finds back? I said, no, I don't really want them. And they said, well, nor do we. There is a real issue that, that there is a huge amount of material being found where, um, you know, the, perhaps it does go into somebody's own private collection, but, but at least if it's being recorded, then that there's some use there. But, yeah. um, but, but, yeah, I agree with what... But very little scientific use. No, no, so, for example, I'm an archaeological scientist. I would have to actually analyse the object yeah, yeah. to get any information out yeah, of it. Know, and I, just I, knowing I, that a spoon was found somewhere yeah. it doesn't really... Do I, I to totally me agree. Yeah. And where the fishing analogy falls down mm -hmm. it is that, that these finds don't reproduce. So that, that yeah, when they're <laughs> gone, they're gone. So over, yeah. you know, over a period of time, uh, yeah. there'll be yeah. less and less yeah. to actually find. So, you know... The, should we be taking them off the ground the is, a, is a question. Okay, that's yeah. great, Keith, and thank you. And we've got Lady here, and we're just about winding up. But come on. Yes, there's, there's uh, preservation in situ. Of course, the, um, the situations we've been dealing with is uh, night hawkers um, coming along and the police not responding. I mean, until there's a sort of effective law enforcement on, on illegal activity, the more activity that we make illegal as metal detecting. I mean, where are the police resources to deal with it? You know, um, the night walking was damaging the crops to the extent that the field was almost un unusable, mm. yeah. you know. Yeah. So, well, so, I, I so say that's where the Institute of Detectors comes in. No, 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 no. no, no. It, it is in, in, in some way because um, I've been a little bit disappointed that I, I've put this point across to many of the archaeological bodies that we've been doing research in a laboratory and, and ways of preventing illegal detecting from in instances where you can try and um, uh, disturb the signal to a point that it's uh, unusable to use on your land, a uh, real metal de de detector. Or, or where you've got any um, motion being picked up by a, um, a solar um, base system. So the first thing it looks at is for movement. Of course, it could be a badger or whatever. But the second thing it looks for is signals, or, or um, uh, signals, or even mobile phones. So if it's seeing movement, mobile phones, metal detecting signals, then it sends off the alarm. It can text messages. It can email messages. Uh, and you know, there are ways that, that we can try, uh, and then they're fairly low cost as well, particularly for archaeological sites where they go home at five o'clock. They could just turn this thing on uh, and it will be uh, looking at protecting those sites because um, what you can't do is have security guards all over the country, but what you can do is have uh, people reacting to uh, these types of um, you know, issues. Thank you. I think, folks, we'd better wind up now. Thank you all. Right, uh, Hannah's suggesting any last comments from the panel. Thank you, Hannah. I think we're exhausted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it should be. We've run over my heart. Well, maybe. Does anybody have anything they'd like to say to find out?
From my side of it, um, obviously the, the question that's been up there is, um, you know, what, what is the <laughs> Our institute of <laughs> <laughs> which uh, seems you. to be fairly much ignored on the back. But no, the, you know, um, yeah, I, I am extremely pleased about the support we've had through the um, archaeological and heritage bodies across the UK, and certainly as far as your rescue is concerned, uh, I would hope that, that through this uh, meeting and discussions today that you may feel that the Institute of Tetris mm -hmm. is a good way forward, uh, and if so, uh, you know, it would be great to have your support as a bit supportive mm -hmm. and by way of a reference. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think money. Yeah, not just say money. That again, Tim. Money. Yeah. That's what um, I was going to say. There's this financial value of the, stuff, the, which is. Well, I wasn't even thinking about that. I was no, thinking about support the, for proper antiquity yes. schemes oh, to be yeah. 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 because yeah. as long as we can change hearts and minds, that's the way that we're going to really make a difference. Through through what is support. Yeah. Well, I mean, basically, I mean, obviously, everything we've talked about, you know. You, not deal with the quantity of material that's coming up without the resources to, to do with that and that is both in terms of recording it and also the acquisition of this material um, you know you could either ignore it and say oh well I mean you know so which some, some countries do you know you just say it doesn't happen it's not a problem and then you turn your back to it and it just does go on and you don't have any knowledge from it so I mean obviously we record objects um, in order to gain knowledge and we um, acquire them in order to gain you know the opportunity for the public to see the most important ones and I know it's not a sort of ideal situation. We like the idea that we would have this massive building and we could put the whole of material culture that has ever been thrown away in. But we're getting to a time now where people are throwing so much stuff, or they have, I mean, we're in a culture that throws stuff away like nobody's business. And if you think about that going forward in the future, I mean, we're just going to have so much material culture in the ground. There's going to be more in the ground than there is above ground in, in the future, I think. Um, but in terms of the, obviously, Past material, like Keith had said, you know, it's, it's, it's a disappearing resource. So it's in, we have a, a one off opportunity to record it, and if we don't, then it's completely lost forever. So, as you were saying, Evelyn, it's down to the politicians and getting their support, and then actually them doing something about it, which would be a way. But well, I think the government in this review is actually trying to uh, you know, help that, generate that debate. Yes. I mean, it's the first time we've ever had a consultation where it has very wide ranging kind of questions at the end, which okay, we might not come to any kind of consensus, but at least it's starting a, a debate that then the government will hopefully take on, on forward. Yeah, well, that's impressive. Okay, well thank you very much everybody, and uh, thank you for coming. And uh, also, thank you, thank you Jude very much for organising the session, and Hannah for organising it. Brilliant. I think, I think success today. Thank you, Keith. 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 Thank you, Keith.